Uh, second, uh, second part of the day with uh, artist Cecile. Do you pronounce the B? Do you say Cecile B. Evans or do you? Yeah. <coughs> Sorry, had to check. Um, she's going to talk about uh, a new project she's working on, What the Heart Wants, uh, in which she uh, explores the human in the future and also the question of who gets to be considered a person. Uh, uh, in that future, and it's um, she welcomes questions. So I hope um, um, that we can uh, get into a dialogue with, with her about this project. You will speak for about thirty minutes, something like that. Yeah. So this is around thirty minutes, uh, and enjoy. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, thanks so much for having me. And uh, may I have the presentation? Yeah, awesome. Um, so yeah, as, as mentioned, um, I thought today that I would share with you some of the ideas and the research um, that I've been looking at, working on, talking about um, as I develop this new video installation called What the Heart Wants, Wants which as mentioned, um, is about the future of um, humanity um, and what it could mean to be human in, in a future and who gets to be a person. Um, maybe to begin with, uh, I should say that when I first started making work, um, I was really invested in the value of emotions and the way that they're represented, the way that they circulate, um, the exchanges uh, that, that, that take place. And over the course of the last five years, uh, the value of our feelings, um, as Melanie talked about, um, have skyrocketed immensely. Um, and the way that they're represented uh, is drastically beginning to change. Um, and one of the first points of inquiry, uh, about three years ago, when I was working on a project called Agnes for the Serpentine Galleries, was that I visited uh, an affective computing lab um, and for maybe those of you who might not be familiar, affective computing in its most basic form um, is just uh, the ways in which a computer is programmed and algorithms are developed to be able to recognize emotions but also reciprocate them to create a kind of person to machine exchange. Um, and in, in most of these uh, not-for-profit labs like at MIT or at Cambridge University where I visited, um, this is mostly done for medical research, specifically to help people who have autism, um, who are maybe non-functional in the society that we've created, uh, and maybe need to know what these universal representations are. And the more and more that I talked to these scientists and heard about the work that they were doing, <coughs> they all sort of referred back to um, a study that had taken place by Darwin in 1872 called The Expression of Emotion in Man and Animals. Um, which essentially designated that there are eight universal emotions, things like grief, anger, happiness. Uh, and I really started to ask them some questions about the possibility that someone living in the 1800s could express happiness in the same way that we can. Also, like, how possible is it um, to, like, do they distinguish between stimulated or representations of emotion and like a natural sort of more visceral emotion. Um, another study that was done much, much later in 1972 is Dr. Paul Ekman's Universal Facial Expressions of Emotion. Um, I just last week uh, went to Dr. Ekman's current website and he has a little game that you can play um, to kind of prove some of his theories. Um, that, that it is possible to have universal emotions. And he shows a man from New Guinea who supposedly lives in a society that is illiterate, has never been visited by the outside world. And he asks him a series of questions about to, to sort of make a face on how he would react um, if, for example, he was told that his friends were coming to visit, so he smiles. 
Um, and then the second question is um, for him to make a face uh, in reaction to being told that his child has just died. So while maybe we can entertain the idea that universally maybe some people have similar reactions um, that are not related to culture, eco, eco, economic or social statuses, um, I just think it's problematic to say that there's a universal way to react to finding out that your child has died. Um, and that that uh, implies certain implications and starts to create a culture of emotional labor in the way that we have to communicate. Um, and while with like the scientific research labs, I completely understand the reason as to why they have to um, come up with these hypotheses, what sort of raised more flags was the fact that right next to these labs are commercial labs like Microsoft, Toshiba, and that they use this very same research um, to create products that we use every day and the possibility that at some point we might become obligated um, to make certain faces to make our devices work. Um, I found, I came across, I'm gonna play you guys a clip um, of a video I found on YouTube some time ago, which is not necessarily related to emotion, uh, but the ways in which that facial recognition um, could start to define a person. Um, the title of the YouTube video, just to give you an idea, is called HP Computers Are Racist. At home. <laughs> and the worst part is, I bought one for Christmas. <laughs> I hope my wife doesn't see this YouTube video, but I bought the same computer, I'm and we can't even computer. use it. Look, it's not following me. It's not, Wanda, get back in the frame. It follows Look. me wherever I go. <laughs> I welcome responses to why the HP webcam does not pick up Negroes. <laughs> yeah, um, so there have been other examples. I think Google also had an image recognition program that did some pretty awful stuff. And each time, of course, they have a very appropriate response um, to uh, get rid of the program. Um, another, another example um, that's not related to facial recognition but to the control that um, different interfaces might be able to have on our emotions um, is this Facebook study that Facebook conducted on Facebook with Facebook users without letting them know, um, in which um, they uh, discovered that emotional states can be transferred to others via emotional contagion, leading people to experience the same emotions without their awareness. Um, what I found interesting about the study is that it recognized emotion potentially as a physical thing that can be transferred uh, across different networks and circuits um, and that, that has an impact. Um, also, just this really basic fundamental idea that I've always believed in, which is that you can feel things online um, and that they happen to you in real life. Um, of course, the problem is, is that they didn't tell anyone that they were doing this. Um, a few, and then the, they published this in a scientific journal uh, and people got upset. There were a few sort of like think pieces and clickbait articles. Um, but clearly, for the most part, things sort of didn't change because a few weeks ago to a month ago, they unrolled an even more blatant sort of display of wanting to know how we're feeling or how they could impact it with their emoji reactions. Um, yeah, which is also sort of an implication of, of this uh, this service wanting to participate in humanity and also wanting us essentially to work for free to make things easier because like the thumb apparently was, was too vague or you know they wanna make these advances. Um, Facebook is an interesting example. They seem to be rapidly expanding and it's becoming clear that they want to be more than just a social media platform. Uh, they announced that they are working on tools um, to bring uh, internet, so to become a service provider in developing nations like India and certain countries in Africa. Interestingly, the India Times had a very strong reaction to this idea of having a filter, um, a commercial filter through which the country's information would be coming through. Um, and they sort of started a petition uh, with the government. Facebook launched a counter petition, which I was asked to sign, um, and it was incredibly vague as to what I would be signing um, I was told that if I signed it, I would, I would be helping to bring uh, democracy um, to, to India. Uh, another company that's been uh, really after this idea of expanding 
is Google. Um, they recently created an umbrella company called Alphabet, uh, which I find symbolically really interesting that they want to conquer everything from A to Z. Um, so they're obviously no longer just wanting to be um, a search engine. They're now beginning to take the decades worth of questions and thoughts and feelings that we've been asking them what we like to eat um, <clears throat> and really working towards expanding that into something Something that all of these companies seem to have in common, uh, and I've looked at sort of branding uh, documents, branding PDFs, is the idea that they really want to be human. Um, the idea being that if, if you are presented as a human entity, um, a population begins to care about you more than just beyond the services or the products that you're providing. And this reminds me of um, a several decades old law in the US and I believe also in the UK called corporate personhood, um, whereby corporations can be recognized as having the same rights as an individual. And the way that this gets used oftentimes um, is when a corporation doesn't want, uh, sort of under the auspices of religious freedom, which is an individual right, um, that they don't provide services or don't provide services to a particular group of people. Um, it's also used in lobbying in um, the U.S. to be able to make uh, donations to political campaigns. Um, and this, I, another thing that I sort of have started to come across more and more is this kind of like meshing and mixing up of the corporate system with other systems like government. Um, something that all of you may be aware of is that Facebook Facebook initiated uh, their safety checks. In the beginning, it was just for natural disasters, but as of the Paris attacks, it became man-made disasters that were occurring. In which case, um, if, you, if they recognize you as being in that location, they ask you to check in as safe, and you can check in other people around you that are safe. Um, and this is like logistically a really useful tool to find out, but it seems to presuppose a lot of things, which is that A, you are a member of Facebook, so that starts to put a value on people who are and who aren't a part of the social network, and also that you have access to the network, which um, having been in a few disasters, unfortunately, it's always the first thing to go. Um, what I found really surprising, actually, was the public's reaction. Um, wonderfully, a lot of people started posting about the attacks that had happened in Beirut and questioning why um, sort of safety checks had not been introduced there. Uh, and what I found curious was not that they had not done it, um, which is not a great thing, obviously, but more that we're reaching a point where the public is starting to demand public and neutral services from uh, private and corporate entities. And I'm just kind of wondering, uh, how, how did we get here with these expectations? The corporate is not only aiming to be personal, it also begins to have social and political implications. Another instance where this has happened recently is in the Apple versus San Bernardino, uh, Apple San Bernardino case versus the US government, um, in which case uh, the, the suspects for um, a terrorist attack, uh, the US government wanted to unlock their iPhone and Apple said that absolutely not, and that this would create a huge privacy risk. Um, and at first, when I heard about this, I was like, yay, privacy. Um, but then on the other hand, I just thought like, hang on a minute, if they actually win, which they did in another case, um, this sort of starts to position uh, a hierarchy, in which case a corporation uh, starts to have more rights than the government. Um, I mean, that says something, of course, about the state of the governments as they are worldwide. Um, but I just, yeah, I don't know, it, something didn't quite sit right. This uh, Business Insider article um, actually says something really important, I think, um, and what I'm thinking about a lot in, within this project. Um, a grieving father went to Apple and sort of explained that uh, his son had passed away and that his son had previously given him the passcode to get into his iPhone, uh, but that he had just forgotten it in the midst of grief and that he wanted to get back into it. And the author of this article points out that this positions Apple really in quite a tricky ethical place where they start to deem the worthiness of people's feelings and their emotions and sort of the legitimacy, legitimacy um, of how, how they can do things like grieve. 
What I find even crazier um, is that I have a suspicion that the products that they're making may start to make these decisions independently of all of us. Um, this is, oh my God, is this another Business Insider? I think it is. Um, in this instance, uh, someone who had an Android phone was using OK Google. His father had recently passed away. His father used to live in Nice. So he asked, OK, Google, can you please bring up images of Nice and then the date? And OK, Google, uh, with, with the voice dictation um, or the voiceover, uh, responded to him, first of all, let me express my deepest condolences. Your father was an incredible man and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, in reality, this was probably a mistake and sort of a crossing of wires, and OK Google was dictating an email that was sent around the same time and maybe had the word niece in it, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, I am beginning or have believed for a while that this idea of a super intelligence or a sentient being, if it happens within our lifetime, it may happen because of a mistake. I mean, a lot of things have. Um, and then after which it may take us a really long time to be able to figure out what it is exactly, where it lives, how, how it survives. Um, yeah, so, I mean, this brings up a number of human problems. So at this point also, um, this was about seven or eight months ago, and I'm becoming really disillusioned with everything, and I just wanna, I just wanna be a bit more positive. So I went to visit the Future of Humanity Institute at the University of Oxford, who are teamed up with the Center for the Study of Existential Risk. And their job essentially is to project themselves not 10 years, not 20 years, but 20,000 years into the future to take a look at the things that are going on now that might mean that humans don't exist, period. A complete and total extinction of humanity in 20,000 years. Um, and I was lucky enough to be speaking with uh, Andrew Snyder Beatty, who is the Director of Research at the Future of Humanities Institute. Um, and one of the first things that he talked to me about, which reminded me and was kind of a relief to have an articulation of these kind of, uh, the breakdown of bad versus good and sort of the very complicated situation that we're in now, is something called the trolley principle. It's a philosophical principle um, where you imagine that a train is barreling down a set of tracks and uh, on those tracks are five people who are tied to them. And next to the tracks where you're standing, you have a lever, and you can pull that lever and derail the train onto another set of tracks on which there's only one person who's tied to the tracks. Ergo, you save four, five lives, and, you know, five lives versus one. Um, there are many different versions of, of this, the second of which is called the fat villain in which you're standing next to the tracks, you have no lever, there is no extra rail, but there is a really strong, muscular, large person. And if you throw them onto the tracks, then it'll stop the train and you'll save the lives of these five people. Someone else complicated it even further um, and said that this really strong, muscular, tall person also happens to be the person who has tied the five people to the tracks. So do you make the judgment call that this person is bad and therefore has less value than the five innocent people who are tied to the tracks. Sorry, this is really grim. Um, uh, and then kind of the last uh, principle is, um, well, there's another one by I don't, the loop. I'm not sure what it is yet. Um, I have to figure that out. Uh, is called the man in the yard, um, in which the lever is back. You don't have an extra set of tracks. If you pull the lever, the train gets derailed. Uh, but it rolls over on a hill and into a yard where a man is taking a nap. And the basic question is, um, do you implicate innocent people into a situation? So um, you could say that drone strikes are a great example of this. There's a target, but there's always collateral damage. It's impossible to really control these explosions in this moment in time. Um, and what are the kind of ethics of that? Um, and when I was discussing this with Andrew, and we were talking about like our favorite popular movies that were being released, notably The Martian, starring Matt Damon, where he gets stranded on Mars, um, and it has to kind of like find a way to survive on this planet that has no water, um, his reaction was really surprising. He said that, that he, he really uh, loved the film, and that he thought it was like actually a really great sort of eventuality of, of these ethical problems, which was surprising because he's a huge advocate for utilitarians and utilitarianism. 
Um, and he was commiserating with me that in movies like Interstellar, the utilitarian person is always the bad person, um, or is kind of like the annoying, like the stick in the mud. So I kind of pointed out to him that in order to save Matt Damon on Mars, they were, I don't know if you guys have seen this movie, but essentially they needed the team of astronauts that he was working with to turn around and risk their lives just to save his. Um, so I asked him, like, how, how can you stand for this? Uh, and he responded that because of the advancements that Matt Damon was making in his survival, um, that this could teach future generations how to, li you know, how to live under difficult circumstances on other planets, um, and that this risk ultimately had to be taken. Uh, I later remembered that actually he had video recorded everything, um, so he didn't really need to save him. But, um, but yeah, I just, I thought this was an interesting example of, of how this is even seeping into the so-called uh, mainstream. Um, I mean, this, this also, like a more practical example that Andrew gave me um, about, about this kind of thing is, is that his boss, Nick Bostrom, who heads both departments at Cambridge and Oxford, um, asks people, let's imagine a world uh, in which every generation lives five years longer than the generation previously. But unfortunately, that's not the natural order of things. If we implemented a euthanasia plan, we could save $1 trillion each generation. And he asks people, you know, are you down with this? Um, and most people say, no, that's completely inhumane. Um, and then he asks them, let's say we invest a trillion dollars into anti-aging research. We can achieve five years of extra life each generation. And people also say, no, 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 we can't do that. That's inhumane. And I also just, again, that's sort of like this impossible situation of, of coming into. One thing he also talked to me about that was really helpful in understanding why we're unable or incapable of, of making um, these decisions is scope and sensitivity. Um, they have another test in which uh, they did interviews with a large group of people and asked them, how much would you be willing to pay to save 2,000 birds from an oil spill? And the average answer was something like $80. They asked another big group of people, how much would you be willing to pay to save 200,000 birds from an oil spill? And the average answer was $80. Um, this kind of points out, sorry, this is a picture of a woman taking a selfie on a train track. But um, it just kind of points out, uh, and, and sort of my conclusion with this, is that really, oftentimes, the only people who can make these decisions are the ones who are tied to the tracks, and unfortunately, don't really have a say in the situation. Um, but what I really admire about uh, Andrew and the Future of Humanity Institute is they're actually quite positive about technology. Um, in, in uh, one of the conversations that we had, he talked about how things have actually been getting better over time because of technology. Things like violence is declining, there are more human rights around the world, feminism, literacy. Um, but on the other hand, when I asked him if he thought that the time that we're living in was unique, uh, he responded, absolutely, because, uh, because of the atomic bomb, this is the first time in history in which everyone who's alive today has lived in a time in which we could completely destroy ourselves. Um, so my takeaway from that is that things are getting better, but they're also getting a lot worse. Um, or, um, and we're kind of unable to understand our own scale. And also because we understand that things are getting better, we are understanding as well that the systems that we're living in now are unable to support a future world that could help those things come to fruition. Um, so yeah, it's no wonder that artificial intelligence, what James Barrett calls our final invention, has caused so much worry. In fact, it's named as one of the greatest existential risks to humanity by both departments and Stephen Hawking, um, and they discuss this as a kind of final filter uh, within the human species for which we have to overcome. Um, another thing that they discuss uh, as sort of one of the, as something that's at stake and what could be an amazing possibility is the possibility for um, a substrate autonomous existence. Um, and things could get really awesome, in which case a consciousness could be distributed across a broad network, the same way that our consciousness is presumably distributed across a broad network of neurons. So why do we want to be human in the first place? Um, and 
through these like opposing ideas of like humanism and the future of humanity, but also a really heavy strain of transhumanism throughout both departments, that they really believe that this is the future. I also was really curious to find out if they're advocating for humanity and for the survival of humanity, but at the same time really opening and welcoming change for us to become post-humans or transhumans. Um, at what point do they become transhumanists and what happens to everyone that's left behind? And their response, again, is very positive. They are really hoping for cohabitation. Um, uh, yeah, but just using the example of the moment through which Neanderthals, the tiny blip in time where Neanderthals and Homo sapiens existed at the same time. Um, this is Martine Rothblatt. Uh, and I think she's really useful to think about in terms of this idea of like who gets to be human. Um, she started out as the inventor of satellite radio uh, and then moved on because her daughter, uh, one of her daughters was ill with a very rare disease for which the medicine was not being produced readily. So she created a pharmaceutical company that exclusively produces um, these rare, rare medications and makes them available. Um, but what she's mostly working on now is the idea of mind cloning. Um, so that's the idea that you could upload a mind file, so to speak, so upload your brain to the network, um, create multiple existences that could faction for the fluidity of your, um, of, of the self, but also um, to, to live forever and to just sort of expand, expand consciousness. And she's working on this with her wife, uh, Bina Rothblatt, and they've created um, a manifestation to start uploading Bina's mind files um, into this great robot called Bina48. Um, there are plenty of videos of Bina48 being, Bina being interviewed online. I strongly encourage you to look at them. And it's still in like very early clunky stages. Um, but I would, what I love most about them as a couple is how passionate they are about diversity and the fact that they discuss things like poverty um, and that they, they are really the only ones that I've come across who are truly working towards making this available for everyone and completely inclusive. I Skyped with Bruce Duncan, who's the head of their, um, of the Terrasum movement, which is the foundation that they've, uh, that they've put together. And he was trying to articulate some of the ways in which they're like just doing this on a smaller scale at the moment. For example, they visited Cuba and, um, spoke with a group of elderly people who had never used the internet before and talked to them about how they could uh, archive their memories in different digital forms, which is great because I think that's a sort of discrimination that doesn't get talked about quite often, is um, older people and how they will fit into this, how I will fit into this in 50 or 60 years. Um, they've started their own social media platform called LifeNot. Uh, in which you can start to upload your own mind files in anticipation of the day where mind cloning actually becomes possible. Um, and you can do this for free. Uh, um, another thing that they discuss, they also have, to be honest, a religious bent, um, but it's slightly confu confusing in the sense that they are a religion that welcomes all religions as well as people who do not believe in religion. So I think they're just, they're just trying to add in um, something that I think doesn't get talked about frequently enough, which is the soul. Um, and I think that's an interesting topic. But one of the tenets of the terrorism movement is that death is optional which also links back to Nick Bostrom and the Future of Humanity Institute. He has this uh, very moving fable called The Fable of the, Ty the Dragon Tyrant, in which he describes death as a tyrannical dragon that lives in a village that people have come to accept as a part of daily life, um, have even developed rituals around, uh, and a general sense of acceptance that this dragon is just like, you know, the end all be all. Um, and. Uh, even if they don't achieve any of these goals within our lifetime, I just think it's a nice idea to start thinking about how can we age better? Um, how can we use technology in, in a transhumanist way to benefit everyone? Um, so that eventually this idea of what, what it means to be post-human doesn't have to be so scary. It can be all inclusive. There can be a sense of like cohabitation. This is what they're really hoping for. Um, and Google, uh, their super intelligence that they're working on in like a journalistic interview uh, kind of piece 
was uh, asked, what is the meaning of life? And it said, to live forever. Google, of course, uh, owning now as part of Alphabet, the C is Calico, California Life Company, who is dedicated, along with Ray Kurzweil, to curing death. <laughs> um, so where I'm at now is the world of what the heart wants and this kind of future. I just want to include both sides of the argument. So the corporate one where the interests um, at best are that the company becomes human and has a sort of lasting legacy that lives beyond its creators, um, but that is very much implicated in the existing systems. Um, and these other factions of people who are invested in, in a different kind of greater good um, that includes more people um, and, is, and is largely more philosophical. Um, so to deal with this, uh, I created a narrator <coughs> that will appear from the beginning of the video. The narrator's name is Hyper, and she is that system. Um, and uh, this is how she, sort of an example of how she may appear in a bodily form, um, but she's also very explicit about how she exists as an environment. Um, these are sort of like early prototypes of what her body will look like and her face. Um, and she's incomplete, she hasn't reached full fruition. Uh, and then from that point onwards, you'll meet um, the humans, inhumans, digital agents that are sort of a result of the world that she's created with these very best intentions. So for example, you'll meet a trio of lovers that's now down to two lovers, who are lovers not because of any sexual orientation, but because they love constantly, freely and hard. They are not recognized by the system, they don't have the right passports, and therefore do not pass as human. Um, and they live in abandoned spaces like the Tanashio Meeting House uh, outside of Fukushima, an abandoned mall in Kuwait uh, that's now been infested with sharks, uh, and also uh, Mike Tyson's jacuzzi room. <laughs> um, you also meet a group of students who are so advanced that they do not recognize the system. And so Hyper keeps them in, in a special place, along with their friend, the care robot now, who's made by Aldebaran Robotics, um, who acts as a translator, but who also represents um, something that is very much uh, happening now, which is care robots to deal with an aging population, but also children with autism um, and things like that. You also meet uh, a work cooperation of disembodied ears that live at a pink lake and mine the minerals. Um, I'm also including Phil, who was a character in a video called Hyperlinks or It Didn't Happen that I believe was screened here a month ago. Um, but you'll meet Phil and, and it being much further in the future, he's now a copy without origins. You'll meet Agnes again, um, who's a project, uh, the project that I mentioned before. She's a spam bot who used to live on the Serpentine Gallery's website. She's retreat, uh, received a complete upheaval. She has a new voice. She appears in commercials throughout the video. Also a memory from 1972, which is based on a Craigslist ad um, that someone posted about a man who was planning to kill himself uh, right after the Vietnam War or at the end of the Vietnam War, but met this woman who changed his mind and now he's looking for her like 50 years later. And then a letter from 1974 from the woman that he met, who's reimagined as Christine Chubbuck, um, who is uh, who was a real broadcaster. It's, fict it's a fictionalization of her, a real TV broadcaster who actually killed herself on air. Um, and that her producers afterwards made the statement that it was because um, she didn't fit into society, she had a hard time getting married. Um, but then I'm going to imagine the possibility of there being uh, more complexity to uh, a woman of that time. Um, and I'll end with this character. I think it's another great example of these ethics that I've been talking about and sort of the problems. Um, in the video, a human cell called Gila will appear. It's called the immortal cell. And it comes from Henrietta Lacks, who uh, in, the mid in the mid 20th century was a black woman who died of ovarian cancer at the age of 31. And after her death, um, as was standard at the time, they uh, took samples and, and things of her blood for medical testing. And one thing that was unique with her blood was that her cells continued to mutate and change 
Uh, and they could basically throw anything at it, and they continued to survive and continue to survive to this day. And the amazing thing about them is that they managed to create 11,000, over 11,000 patents, including uh, vaccinations for polio, um, medical treatment, treatments for AIDS and cancer. In 1971, uh, some of the scientists from the lab, that one of the labs, because she was kind of spread everywhere, um, phoned uh, surviving relatives and asked them if they could have a blood sample from the next of kin. And uh, the next of kin was like, I'm sorry, who are you? What do you want with my, my grandma, what? So they'd never been notified. There was no consent form that was ever uh, signed. And obviously the family was very upset about this, especially in the context of the rights of the body of a black woman during this time and times previous. Um, and they entered into a legal struggle that lasted uh, over, yeah, over 30 years and continues to this day. They eventually managed to get um, Henrietta Lacks recognized for her service to humanity. Um, but yeah, it just brings up again this interesting question of like, how do you place value on these things? What's at stake? Um, and if we do reach this point of being uh, post-human, who, who has what? Um, yeah, that's an early prototype for the HeLa cell. And that's, that's kind of about it. Um, maybe it's a good time for questions. What is for you the difference between posthumanism and transhumanism? Because you use both terms um, throughout your presentation. Yeah, I mean, I'm confused about that myself. I think a lot of people are. I think Rosie Bardotti articulates posthumanism or the idea of posthumanism very well um, in, in the idea of like post, uh, the things that, that define different groups of, of humans. So like one problem that she has with a lot of these ideas um, is that it assumes that we're all equal or that there's a universal idea of what a human is um, when that is not the case. And then kind of like expanding on that, some of the concerns revolving around that is that before we achieve like all of these posts, we kind of have to recognize that we're failing in a lot of areas that define these things. And then transhumanism, um, like my basic understanding is that of it is like the moments in which we start to merge with technology in terms of enhancement. So that can mean things like nanotechnology, so nanobots that enter our bloodstream and repair our cells. That could mean um, like if Google were successful and made Google Glass into a contact lens and that gets absorbed into our body and we're able to access information differently, um, things like that. Yeah. Are there any questions about this uh, or thoughts? Yeah. Center for the Future of Humanity, uh, all the options, all the uh, test scenarios or experimental black boxes, they both uh, dealt with the quantification uh, dimension of saving a life or destroying a life. Everything was, had to be quantified. And then they go on to talk to you about how significant and how uh, historically epical is the dimension that, or the fact that uh, uh, humanity can destroy the world through either nuclear or other forms of destruction. And it tends to uh, show their bias and their closure for me because uh, to cite Zizek, uh, they find it much easier to imagine the destruction of the world than to the imagine the destruction of capitalism. Of capitalism. Yep. So I don't know what type of future and how advanced thinking uh, they are, uh, they are advancing. Yeah. The other thing that interests me in, in terms of your own images of, of, of the human uh, going back to the 19th century and your own projections is that you still maintain the frontality and the signature of the face as a, as a designation of the human, uh, which seems to be 
continuous line of figural representation that goes back quite early you know, into Western art history. So do you see uh, in your conceptualization of the post-human, the post-face? Hey, those are awesome questions. Um, I had exactly the same question for Andrew, who I should distinguish at this point. He speaks on his behalf and not the Future of Humanity Institute, perhaps. I mean, these are really casual conversations that we just meet up and have from time to time. Um, but yeah, this idea, I posed him the question, um, could, could capitalism become the greatest existential risk under which all of these things, because uh, they also name climate change as an existential risk, artificial intelligence, um, could, that, could that be the thing that sort of usurps everything else? Um, and Stephen Hawking has, has come back with a second statement to essentially say that, that he's not worried about artificial intelligence, he's worried about our inability to redistribute wealth after uh, the robots replace certain bits of, of labor. Um, and Andrew's personal response um, was to say, yeah, absolutely, um, but if we're looking at history in a very large scale, we have to recognize that there has never been one system and that uh, capitalism has only existed for a finite amount of time and will end and will be replaced by something else. I think also one thing that I've been very frustrated with in the past, not just in speaking with any philosophers or scientists, I've spoken with neurologists, with the Affective Computing Lab, is this idea of the black box circumstance. Now, the Future of Humanity Institute, as philosophers, recognize um, that, that this is a, a sort of perfect situation. And they are a group, very diverse group of people from many different disciplines. And I think that's most of what they sit around and talk about is the feasibility. They're not a legislative body. Um, they're mostly like, they, they, they consult, of course, and I think will continue to have a great impact. But what a neurologist once pointed out to me when I was like, yeah, but no brain is really the same, and I think that's really unfair to say that the amygdala would like cause this, and what if I'm different, and how do I fit in, and da 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 da. And they kind of stopped me and said, like, look, I'm really sorry, but I just really want to save this one person's life. Um, and I think at some point, scientists have to live within these sort of subsets of like, uh, of like a hypothesis, and that that's imperfect, but also recognizing that the human brain has limitations. Um, but I think the future of humanity. Institute is very aware of this and is very frank about this. Um, and then in terms of uh, a post-human face, yeah, I've thought about this like every day, pretty much. Like why, why does Hyper have to have a face? So my solution is like, she has a half face. It's not completely fully formed, um, but that for the moment, um, for me, what I found to be a tool is to remember the time that we're living in now and actually a lot of the things, I'm not really predicting the future, I'm just kind of, as William Gibson says, like trying to create fictions that deal with how crazy things are now. And the face, uh, for example, Phil, um, who is in Hyperlinks, he is a CGI, a failed CGI rendering of a recently deceased actor. And his face, as an image object, contains meaning for a lot of people and becomes a symbol that instantly people have an understanding of how they can relate to it. And I'm always kind of looking at ways within the work, um, at the moment, this could change in the future, um, that I can give people as much as possible to make it a little bit easier, because then I can take them to some really weird places um, and discuss some very strange things. But there are characters within the video, like the Gila cell is just a cell. It's this wiggly thing that has no kind of human form. Agnes doesn't have a body, she's never had a face. She's very clear about how she doesn't want to have a face. Uh, because any face that she would have would be a disappointment to people's expectations. Uh, the lovers, um, their faces become more and more distorted over time. Um, but I still, I still think that the face is very much a signifier of, of, of our existence and hasn't gone away, and that there's no reason for us to be able to imagine a world in which both faces and non-faces can, can exist. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Yeah. Um, just a basic question, but I was wondering if you could explain a little bit more about uh, this video, um, who created it, and how it was created, and how it sort of relates to the research that you were talking about before. Which video? What the heart wants? 
just the characters that you were just presenting. Oh, that's me. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, um, I mean, that's. I mean, that's actually something I try to do a lot. Um, just to like touch on that is, for example, usually I don't do presentations. I kind of have an automated presentation that I read, and then like the attention is on the screen. Agnes, um, as a project, as an existence, living on the Serpentine Gallery's website, she did all the press for it. She did the interviews. Um, more or less similarly with Bill uh, and some of the other characters. And I just found it more useful for them to speak about their own condition. Um, because I'm not so sure. <laughs> like, and I think it just becomes an easier way for people to attach to them rather than me becoming an authority. And then really any answers that could happen, happen within the framework of, of, uh, of the user, of the visitor, of the viewer, and not something that I've said, which changes pretty much every week, if that makes sense. Um, and then what was the second part? How, how did so, they? So if you created it, how, how it was related to uh, the topics that you were talking about before? Yeah, sure. I mean, they each in some way or another represent and are related directly back. Like the lovers relate directly back to the HP's racist video in the sense that they have faces that are not recognized by the system. Um, the children represent, not autistic children, but children who are so far advanced that uh, they just live in a different world and don't really, really um, fit into this. Um, and then in terms of like posthumanism, I mean, Hyper is, is the ultimate posthuman. She has achieved what all of these companies are sort of looking for, which is complete domination, a complete understanding of what it is to be human and a human relationship with, with everyone around it. Um, I mean, I don't really like making predictions, but one thing I've discussed with everyone is what happens when a technology company becomes nationalized. And not in the sense that DARPA is, is like owned by the US government or GCHQ, but um, as Apple and Google and DeepMind and all of these things begin to provide or what, what we react to as public services and start to eclipse the services that, that um, supposedly neutral bodies are, are supposed to provide. I mean, the Panama Papers is another example of that. There's a question up there. Uh, yeah, that, that in the book, no, oh, yeah, but then it's not recorded. <laughs> um, um, you're talking about um, park rangers and whether artists are potentially taking the position potentially of a fighting fire with fire. And if, and then in that case, what's the difference between accelerationism and subversion? Okay, I don't know if I'm gonna answer this, but I do, I've been thinking a lot about position lately. Yeah. As an artist, I think there's always someone who asks like, what is, I don't get what your position is. Not to me, but to a lot of artists um, who are assuming a kind of supposed neutrality. And I would argue that like not having a position sometimes is the position. Um, and just, I think I've come to a point that I accept that I have limitations and that these characters become a way with which to discuss the different options. Um, for example, in the script, um, some characters discuss the recent happen thing that happened where Pierre Berger made a statement about uh, Versace and H&M um, making hijab and burkinis um, and how this was akin to the enslavement of women. Um, and then in like the comment section, it broke out that um, uh, like that this was awful and that like how dare he, you know, decide for like I think the, the I think the damning statement was that women we should liberate women so that they can expose themselves or feel free to undress. Um, I personally uh, take offense to that. Um, I think it's a lot of work to undress um, and has been for, for many years. And I think it, at, at best we should be able to choose whether or not we can. Um, so that would be my personal argument. But then as an artist also, I'm more interested in challenging my own opinion and looking at the comment section that comes afterwards which is people who are saying not all women who wear a hijab have the choice. Um, and then also taking into account above that, that not all of these dressed and undressed people who have choice or no choice are in the comments section. 
And that's what I was talking about with scope and sensitivity, the inability to sort of include all of the voices, even as we start to hear more and more of them. Um, uh, Ray and Charles Eames, the designers, they have a really great quote, quote that I keep coming back to, that's after the age of information comes the age of choices. And I think we've been stalling those choices for a long time because, because of those. Um, and I just, I think it's great when artists do take positions. I think really strong work comes of that. I think really strong work also comes out of ambiguity and the ability to let things emerge, especially so that the viewer themselves uh, are able to come, come to their conclusions, whatever they may be. One huge danger that I have still with this project as I'm kind of coming towards a sort of end with it is to avoid being moral. Um, I think there's a lot of stuff that I'm upset about. There's, it seems like there's crisis happening every day. Um, it never seems to go in the way that, that we want or expect it to. Um, and I just, I don't try to silence that voice. I try to include it with the possibility um, that I could be wrong and that there could be something worse or there could be something better um, or that we, or the reality that we just live in this time that's very confusing. Um, Andrew also, uh, Andrew and Bruce, um, sort of brought up this idea of, of individualism being a harm uh, to our society, like worldwide today. Um, and the idea that at present time, we have an inability to include mul multiple, to productively include multiple positions and multiple points of views, and to accept that like, even if something is bad or doing damage, like that, that does, you have to accept that that exists within our world and that will never go away. I don't know if that, that answers your question. Um, there's, if there's another question, we have time, but otherwise uh, it would be good to move on. Um, am I missing someone? It's hard to see sometimes with the lights. No, it seems everyone is good. <coughs> uh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>